Welcome everyone to this presentation on fully guided full arch solutions. I'm very happy to have you guys joining me today on this very exciting topic. And we're gonna go through a number of cases that illustrate the power of digital dentistry and guided solutions. A little bit about myself, I graduated in 2010 at the University of Western Ontario. I started to place implants right away after the first year. And a lot of that had to do with the mentorship around me with my father-in-law having been uh, in the implant field as well and placing implants for over 30 years himself. If you're not familiar uh, about the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network, this is a network online that I've developed for dentists and technicians and anyone in the dental field with over 13,000 members and growing with free membership online. It's an online community for discussing implant dentistry and you're welcome to join for free. As well, we're part of the IDDA Branch Canada, which is a focus group on developing and growing digital dentistry solutions for dentists and everyone in the dental community. As well, I'm an author on PRF and Next Gen Biomaterials textbook. You can find some of my publications in these two uh, books, most recently, the Understanding Platelet-Rich Fibrin textbook with Dr. Myron, as well, one of my favorite topics is the emergence profile management using the cervical system around dental implants. I always say to find your passion, but to do so, you need a good support system. So my wife, as well as a dentist, uh, who practices implant dentistry as well, and uh, these are two lovely kids, Jason and Emily, who put up with the hours that I have to commit to doing these kinds of presentations and projects. Back before COVID happened, we used to run a number of hands-on courses in person. We used to have a study club, hands-on education from experts in the dental field, such as Dr. Zastro and his uh, Corey Block technique. We had a number of uh, other experts like Dr. Maurice Salama. We had our All on X course with myself and Dr. Shear. And you know, beyond COVID, we hope to return to regular education soon. We just had our all on X course last month, for example, in Montreal with a great successful group. So what is the purpose of today's uh, presentation? It's gonna be a discussion on fully guided full arch solutions, discussing the digital aspect, the modular approach of the treatment, meaning uh, being able to select and pick and choose which aspects you're going to handle yourself or some of those aspects you're going to delegate to either a manufacturing service or a lab like Stroman and go over the surgical and prosthetic indications for a full arch same day treatment. So what is going to be some of the object objectives? Again, we're gonna look at the rationale and the steps for a guided surgery solutions, including how to communicate and design the case with the laboratory. We're also going to look at patient case uh, selection and acceptance uh, techniques in terms of uh, how to gain acceptance of your cases. We're gonna also look at the digital workflow for these kinds of cases. As we all know, uh, there's a number of classifications which uh, typically full arch dental implant treatment will fall under. First, you have what we consider to be FP1 cases, which are cases in which you're essentially replacing teeth or uh, failing dentition with crown and bridge style restorations, all the way to FP3, in which you're replacing hard and soft tissue. So these kinds of cases are cases where patients are edentulous for a number of years, or maybe they've been, um, you know, had teeth lost for a number of years, and you have to replace not only the, the teeth themselves, but also the tissue architecture. So most of the cases in all on X tend to fall into the FP3 classification, although there are cases uh, where you can go to crown and bridge style treatment as well. Like I mentioned, for full arch treatment, you can split up your treatment into multiple br uh, bridges. So you can have segmental bridges. You can have, for example, in the upper jaw, bridges split up into uh, different smaller units. So this is a bit different than the classical all on four approach where you're having one bridge supported on four or five implants. Typically, these kinds of cases are going to need some kind of uh, bone grafting, may need some kind of uh, soft tissue augmentation and additional implants in order to deal with having the bridge done with uh, segmental approaches. What about cases where you're trying to approach the case in a, 
uh, one bridge, one piece bridge solution. Should you graft or not? How far distally can you extend your prosthesis back without grafting? So when we look at all on X solutions, we try and minimize the grafting needed for patients. We try and minimize the sinus procedures for patients because those involve extra time and money considerations for these cases. And when we try and look at success criteria for these cases, there's a, there's a great list by actually Dr. Paolo Mauro, the developer of the all-on-4 technique. And he goes through a number of these criteria. And uh, we're gonna go through some of them uh, today, not in depth, but at least a touch base on to how to set up the case for success. So his uh, criteria for success list basically goes through the vertical dimension of the patient, lift support for the patient, smile line for the patient, including arch relation, occlusion, and aesthetics. So when you have a patient that comes in like this, you can know right away that there's a loss of vertical dimension. And it can be either from decay, it can be from loss of the posterior vertical stop. And we need to plan the case for success by approaching it in a traditional, um, basically a denture patient, in order to develop the case from the prosthetic point backward. So here's a lovely patient of mine that I'm in the process of working up her case. And we need to ensure that the smile line, which is uh, seen typically on someone doing an exaggerated smile, is not visible when we plan our case from the end point backward. Because if this is not done properly, you could have a really highly unesthetic outcome. So in these kinds of cases where you don't have a stable vertical dimension for your patient, you're typically going to be doing a workup. In this case, we use something called the dual scan technique for the patient. In essence, we're making a denture and duplicating this denture with markers that are scanned in the CBCT machine. So the patient's going to wear the denture and then we're going to also scan the denture separately. And you can see here's the denture with um, these little nubs or markers that are noted in the area. And this helps to translate the ideal vertical dimension for the patient back into our software to design the case digitally. So we now bring the case back into our co-diagnostic software. And we're able to take that temporary design and bring it into the design solution in place for our proposed implant positioning. So this is typically how we're approaching all our all on X cases in terms of planning the case backward. How about the digital workflow for these cases? Record taking is so crucial in these cases. So there's a number of elements that are very important. We begin with a CT scan for our patients. We take either impressions with PVS, or if you have access to an intraoral scanner, then you will take an intraoral scan for your patient. You will also take highly um, accurate photographs. I recommend taking, you know, not just uh, pictures with low resolution on an iPhone, but getting really good photography for your patients. And also then you're going to be bringing in that information into your design software. So in our office, we use a combination of the co-diagnostic design software for the prosthesis. And we also use Exoplan, uh, design software for planning of the implant positioning. Next, we bring that into our 3D printer and for uh, design of the temporary and also for final fabrication of the prosthesis in our in-house lab with the milling um, center. So what does our digital workflow look like? So we have access to a Medit intraoral scanner and desktop scanner. In addition, our other practice has access to a triage scanner. Both of these scanners are excellent and able to capture the data accurately. And then we take that data and then bring it into our design software. And finally, using a number of great printers like the Sega printer, in order to create a temporary for the same day surgery. So you can see here, we're able to capture the data quite nicely for our patient. And this is also a great way to explain to the patients what you see on the scan. So I, I would recommend to look into the digital solutions in terms of being able to scan the cases. What is a desktop scanner used for? In our practice, we have multiple providers, including assistants and hygienists. So the desktop scanner can be used to digitize impressions for night guards. You can use it for study models. 
you can also d digitize existing dentures. So if you're planning to do more of these full arch cases, the desktop scanner is also a great addition to not just the intraoral scan. And you can see here's the desktop scanner. It's able to capture the arch all in one go and digitize that record for you. What about the CT scanner? The CT scanner is very important because you're able to capture that data and then bring it back into your software for implant planning. So you can either do this in office or outsource the CT scanning to a center of choice. However, keep in mind there's some limitations. You can get distortions, especially if there's uh, areas of uh, metal, like uh, somebody having a partial denture in metal, you may want to duplicate that so you don't get distortion when you're scanning them in there. There are limitations of field of view, especially in Ontario and in Canada versus what we can capture versus uh, a general dental practice versus the oral surgeon's practice. You may need to capture two scans, for example, for the upper and lower in some cases where you have some patients with longer faces where you need to capture more of the sinus. At least in Ontario, we're responsible also for interpreting these reports. So we're able to either do this ourselves or we send the reporting out to have the, the observations and the, basically the pathology assessed of these cases before going ahead. So I recommend to outsource them to the radiologist locally and have uh, that reporting done for you outside. Like I mentioned, we use something called the dual scan technique often in these cases. So we're uh, basically duplicating the patient's existing denture if they have a well-fitting denture, and we're placing a number of radio opaque markers. I use something called the SureMark system, and these have the ability to be uh, stuck on the denture. And then we're basically scanning the patient with the denture in place and with the denture out. And then we merge that uh, denture um, scan into the in, inside our software with the bone scan and then we plant our surgical planning positions in terms of relation to tooth positions and vertical dimension of the denture. So when can you not use this? Like I mentioned if you have metal frameworks and dentures or if you have really poor fitting dentures it's better to get a, a nice temporary denture either made by yourself or the dentures in order to get that perfect setup because that's gonna dictate also the outcome of your surgery. If you have cases that are dentate, it's a bit easier. You're just going to want to ensure you have bite taps to open the patient up. That way you can get the relationship of the teeth separately and then you can uh, basically match similar points on the scan of your teeth and the digital version to allow merging with your CT, uh, CT data. In this case, we just show an example with using another form of radio opaque markers, you can use gutta perka points, and you're going to place anywhere between six to 10 markers, and then have the patient taking the scan with the denture in place and with the denture out. For photography, that's a whole separate topic on its own. Um, I'd recommend highly to take a photography course if you're serious about things, but basically you're going to want to have smiling photos at rest, lips parted, retracted, with and without the prosthesis in place and these are taken at eye level with your patient. Why do we want to do this? Number of reasons, patient education. You're also going to uh, use these photography and images in order to treatment plan your cases, in terms of your midline, your smile arch, and surgical planning of your cases. As well for documentation sake, you can also show what the patient how they started and give them an expected outcome with the photos that you have in place. In terms of planning, we use a number of software in the office. We use ExoPlan, for example, and Codiagnostics for Full Arch. There's a number of other software um, companies out there, including Blue Sky Bio, 3Shape has an implant studio package. I haven't used that myself, but there's a number of software uh, packages that are out there if you're looking to design this software yourself or work with a local lab. I know Stroman has a great um, basically modular approach in terms of uh, providing these services in which you can have the design done by them and if you want to print the temporary or the prosthesis you can do that yourself. So let's jump into the fun stuff and we'll go through some cases next of how we typically set up 
these cases for success in our office. So here we have a case of, of a 58-year-old male. He's a non-smoker, and he's uh, basically coming in and complaining about his inability to chew with his lower teeth. He's complaining of abscesses and his teeth uh, getting transient swellings from infections and wants to get rid of his lower denture. So the patient here has severe periodontitis on the lower teeth, uh, many missing lower teeth, and uh, there's a number of teeth with infections that are failing. So you can see on the x-rays here, the lower denti dentition is not looking so great. However, usually in the lower jaw, we can place implants successfully and most of the time immediately load the case while avoiding these sites of infections. So we can go ahead and design our software, uh, our case in our software, and uh, see what comes up next. So we use co-diagnostic software with Smile in a Box Solutions, and this is a, a service provided by Strawman in which you can set up a call with them, the treatment plan, the number of implants you want, the position of multi-units, pin positions, bone reduction required for your hybrid, and uh, you can confirm uh, all this information and then they will send you either the guides or the guides and temporaries back. So in our office we're doing the design from start to finish and milling ourselves but if you don't have access to those services you can use the services from the Strawman team to help you out. So this call is very important because you're going to confirm um, these critical things like the number of pins that you need. Typically you're wanting to have at least three to four pins to help stabilize your guide. You're also going to confirm your implants that you're choosing for your case. And if you're doing this in a traditional technique approach, typically you're duplicating your denture. And you may want to have the lab give you a bone reduction window in which you can see where you're going to reduce your bone to and ensuring that the prosthesis, the multi-unit elements of the abutments draw through the lingual access channels of the temporary. This is a paddle supported traditional in the upper jaw, for example. You may have issues though, such as canting of your prosthesis, especially in the lower jaw. As well, are you over or under reducing with this? How about multi-unit angulations and positions? So there's a bit of guesswork in terms of doing things in a freehand approach method. Well, I recommend for starters to know how to always fall back on this. This is the beauty of digital dentistry and being able to design your case from start to finish, knowing exactly where each element needs to emerge in your case ahead of time. And we're gonna walk through that next. So the treatment planning calls lets you, like I mentioned, plan your implant positions. Typically we're aiming anywhere between five to six implants if the anterior to posterior spread allows it to uh, maximize the basically the implant positionings and decrease the cantilever length. In this case we were able to plan for six implants to be placed immediately fully guided and there's a number of implant selections that I've listed on the side here. All were managed uh, to be able to be placed uh, using straight height multi-unit abutment, which is always easier to handle and work with. And the nice thing about the Neodent system is that it has a platform switch feature, ensuring that you can place your implants up to three millimeters subcrestal. And the nice thing about that is that it relates to tissue thickness, because we want to ensure that we have adequate tissue thickness for preserving the biological width around our implant in the long term. So the system has these very nice angulated multi-unit abutments using straight 17 and 30 degree uh, solutions. And they have a very nice curvature to them, allowing the system to be placed subcrestal without having to worry about the prosthetics impinging on the bone or having to remove too much bone to get the prosthesis parts to sit. And most of the time, you're going to be going with one and a half to two and a half millimeter height multi-unit abutment. You can see in our case here, even though you're placing your implant subcrestal, the feature of the system is that you can go subcrestal and still ensure that you have a very nice seal around the head of the implants using those components. In terms of pin positions, you're going to be aiming for three to five pins to stabilize your base plate, wanting an anterior to posterior spread that's even. 
and the pins are typically going to be placed below the roots or the existing bone for stability. In our case, like I mentioned, we printed all the guides in office on a Sega Max printer. We had a mill temporary prosthesis to be made ahead of time to be picked up during surgery. And you can see here some of the printed guides that were made for the time of surgery on the pin base plates. So let's walk through some of the procedures of the, the steps of the procedure next. So most of the time we're sedating these patients fully. We're working with uh, deep sedation in our office for these cases. So local is given to the patient and the seating guide is placed with the pin guide for drilling the pin osteotomy positions. Then the remaining teeth are removed atraumatically. We're going to make sure we really cure, cure the infected sites out. Next, the, bane, the base plate is pinned into position with a mallet for pin seating. And then we're performing our alveoplasty bone reduction. And this is all predetermined ahead of time to the amount that we have pre-planned for the bone reduction. And the bone reduction is done with two methods, either using a piezo or using a surgical round burr, which is a bit quicker. So just to illustrate from past two cases, one was done freehand, the other one was done using a guided approach. The piezo does coagulate the area a bit better, so you have less bleeding, but it does take longer in terms of bone reduction. Next, the osteotomy guide is stacked, and then we're using our fully guided neodan kit for the osteotomy site preparation. And now we're placing our implants through the guide to the ideal pre-plan depth. So your implant, once it's placed to that depth, it will bottom out because you've prepped the area to that pre-plan depth. And this is a very nice trick that I saw at the last uh, Neodan Symposium last year before all this uh, COVID fun stuff uh, started to occur. But this is a video courtesy of Dr. Tomei, and this is what we call a bone suturing technique. So in cases where you have a lot of extra tissue, you can use this as a method to tie down the tissue so it doesn't bunch up and cover your abutments during the conversion by placing a suture through the bone to hold the tissue down. As well, if you need to augment or you need to graft, if at the time of surgery you're able to get blood draw from your patient, you can use the combination of PRF if you're uh, using that currently in order to augment the ridge and also to cover any uh, areas needing exposure of the bone graft. So if you're interested to learn more about this aspect of it, I'd highly recommend to check out the Understanding Platelet Rich Fibrin textbook, which just came out, uh, edited by uh, my dear friend, Dr. Richard Myron, and I have a chapter included in there as well on extraction site management using PRF. So jumping back to this case, where we were, we were able to use straight multi-units on all the areas. So if you can have straight multi-units, it's the best thing. Why? Because these are very easy to use and you're not having to worry about two small screws now in order to um, hold the multi-unit down into position. Typically, we're placing the multi-unit abutments in place and we're also uh, using resorbable sutures that don't need to be removed and then having our patient come back uh, in a week's time to check on everything. Um, next, we were able to pick up the prosthesis using temporary cylinders, and these are attached to the multi-unit abutments. Typically, you're placing a rubber dam underneath to protect the bone and block out the access holes so that they don't have the material that's used for pickup. For our office, we're using something called the vocal quick up, and this is a material that is um, self or like here acrylic and it's uh, very easy to use and handle in inside the mouth. Next you take the PMMA out and you're going to go now to finishing and polishing. While this happens if you're able to take a master model impression with your multi-unit analogs poured up and um, then you'll reseat the bridge back on. The reason is that if you have this master model made if anything happens during healing and you need to do a repair or you need to uh, speed up the process towards the final prosthesis, then you have that record already handled. 
this is a short little uh, video that uh, I got courtesy of Strom, and I won't go through the whole elements of it, but basically the, the prosthesis, once it's picked up, you're going to go through a number of uh, cleanup steps in terms of removing the handles that were used to sit on the, on the guide, and you're also going to fill in any voids to ensure that you have no ledges, you have no undercuts, or any sharp ledges in position. So if you want, you're going to remove these. You can use a pink colored acrylic if you wish to fill this in. Most of the time we just leave them using the, the light color as shown below as patients are not uh, pulling their lip to look at it. And uh, just cleaning up the prosthesis before inserting it back into position. Digital alternatives for doing uh, these cases include systems like the PIC Dental and the iCAM 4D. So that's a whole separate topic, but I wanted to touch base on it briefly to tell you that not all cases need to have traditional impressions taken. And there are a number of methods like this that are used to speed up the process for verification of your final process. So I would highly uh, recommend to check out these two systems if it's something that is uh, within the scope of your practice and you can afford to, these are great methods that help to bypass the need for verification of your prosthesis at the end. However, if you're not making uh, a digital record, then I'd recommend to make, like I mentioned, a master model. And this master model can be adjusted three months after down the road uh, by doing a soft tissue lining underneath your temporary and ensuring that you make a new silicone index underneath it on the master model. So the reason I'd recommend, like I mentioned, to make this ahead of time is that it speeds up the process towards conversion for the file. Back to our case here, in three to four months when the temporary is removed, we're going to check all the multi-unit abutments for full torque. We're going to take x-rays to ensure the case has healed and confirm osteointegration. And we always tell the patients in these cases that tissue management is crucial to the success of the case. So I always discuss ahead of time, there may be a need to augment the soft tissue ahead of time, because if they come back and in three months the tissue is deficient, it's not a surprise. So as an example here, I show a case where the tissue is quite thin around the heel bridge. So a technique employing a vestibuloplasty and free gingival graft is used to protect the implants from muscle activity. So you can see here that if you have any muscle activity, it can cause bone loss around the implants down the road. So this is a very important step before going uh, towards the final to protect the implants. So when the patient comes back to our lab side of things, we always want to ensure now we have an accurate digital record of the file. So we go back into our desktop scanner. We're scanning the temporary on the master model with the new soft tissue changes and then digitizing everything into our design software. And then we can reinsert the temporary back and then scan the opposing, scan the bite, and capture that data again into our design software. In this case, we are using the Neodent multi-unit tie bases and we milled the final in a monolithic zirconia. So there's no cutback, no, uh, basically there's no porcelain at all used in the staining of this, these cases. Reason being, we don't want any chipping or uh, fracture issues. So we use something called the Mio soft tissue and tooth stain and it works quite well in terms of the final outcome. The design and milling next goes to our uh, mill. This is the IMS i core mill using uh, the monolithic zirconia, like I mentioned. And this is the design of the final process. As you can see, we try and aim for a very flat or uh, convex intaglio surface of the final. And there's a number of uh, the equipment that we've used, like I mentioned, the Neodan GM implants, prosthetic components, the co-diagnostic software. If you wish to use a smile in a box design services, you can. And uh, the Sega 3D printer for making the milling of the, the temporary or printing of the temporary and a combination of the desktop scanners and our intraoral scanners. 
So with this prosthetic workflow, we're, allow, we're allowing the patient to go through a minimum number of appointments with a very high degree of accuracy. And we're able to deliver results like this. So the prosthesis at the end looks very lifelike. We're not worrying about uh, cleansability of the case because it's designed in a very tissue friendly material. And next, we can go on to the patient's upper jaw and deal with some of the dentition needing treatment there. Case two will illustrate the power of digital dentistry and why I believe in these cases, doing this freehand may not be the best approach. Often, you encounter these cases with what we call an hourglass shaped mandible. And you can see that if uh, you start to plan your case on the right side, your implant positions relative to the teeth are going to be quite lingual. So when you design the case, you actually have to bring out your, your teeth positions back to where it used to be. So you have to use multi-units to uh, basically tip everything facially. So if you were to do this freehand in the mouth on the day of surgery, it would be very hard to guess as to these positions. So again, we go through the same workup using the smile in a box solution, using the co-diagnostic software. So we're raising a full flap and pinning our pins into position. And you can see that there's a considerable amount of bone reduction needed in this case in order to get even a five and a half to six millimeter wide ridge for placement of our implants. And that's usually the case in these uh, mandible shapes with an hourglass figure. So you can see here the bone reduction is performed next. Our osteotomy guide, implant placement, and placement of our multi-units. So these multi-units, like I mentioned, they are facially tipping the, the prosthesis such that the teeth are now back in the correct position. So the bone reduction that we have done has placed everything very lingual. So we need to have the multi-units bring everything back facially to line up in the correct spot. So next we go ahead and pick up our temporary cylinders and ensure we're blocking out the cylinders and then pick up of our temporary. So this is the ridge at, uh, at removal of the temporary three months later, you can see now we need to focus on a bit of soft tissue work to protect our implants in the long term. And then we put our patient again in a second temporary set before finalizing the aesthetics and the bite issues. So this is a short video just to illustrate some of the steps I have been discussing. So the first step is to confirm the positioning of our, of our pins, making sure that this seats correctly on the, on the dentition and the flap reflection. Like I mentioned, these pins are typically placed below the roots of the teeth. And then, our, and then we're using our fully guided neodent kit. So if you want to see more cases, I would really recommend to check out our online forum. So we have the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network forum on our Facebook page. There's a number of great cases on there and uh, those cases are illustrated under the guide section or you can search for full arch underneath it. Case number three, which is our final case, was actually a very exciting case because this was the first new dent case in North America 
done using the smile in a box solution approach. And this case is very unique because first it's a double arch, it's top and bottom, but also the state of the patient's dentition was in uh, such a state that the teeth were so loose we couldn't capture records using uh, regular impressions. So you can see here we're using our TRIOS scanner to capture records because the teeth were too loose. So that's another advantage of going with the digital approach to these cases. And let's walk through some of the steps again. So again, we're going to confirm seating of our guide. You can see between the last picture and this one, we've lost some of the front teeth because of COVID shutdown, the patient ended up losing a number of front teeth. So we had to take uh, new records on the most stable teeth which were then used to stabilize the guides. Okay, so we perform our flap reflection, pinning of our pins into position. We go ahead and perform our bone reduction. And then our osteotomy guide is seated into position. And you'll notice also the osteotomy guide has these markings on it, and these markings coincide to the positioning or the timing of multi-unit abutments that are angulated. So if the angulated multi-units are, uh, multi-unit abutments are used, this will tell you the timing or the positioning of where they need to stop in order to get the case lined up perfectly. And then we go ahead and pick up our temporary, and then moving on to the lower jaw. So same technique steps as before. And this is where we end up on the bottom. And you remember if I, uh, I mentioned at the start of the presentation, the importance of the soft tissue work, you can see in a lot of these cases, especially if the patient has had a history of, of gum disease or uh, of tissue loss, they're going to end up with really thin tissue. So you can see around this middle implant, the tissue uh, is not very keratinized. It's uh, almost uh, mucosa. So you need to ensure that before you go to the final prosthesis, perform a soft tissue graft, and it's important to discuss this ahead of time with your patient before you uh, bring it on as a surprise. So we go ahead and perform free gingival grafts on both sides. And you can see that we have a very nice, now stable uh, band of tissue around our multi-unit abutments to protect the area for years to come. Next, we're going to go through our workup. So we can see um, this is the first temporary trial for the patient. You can see that the midline is a little bit off. So this is where we want to work out issues in terms of uh, teeth setups, uh, midline aesthetics with our photography. So we mark in position using either flowable or marker the changes we want to make. And this is our first temporary where you can see there's a bit of a, an open bite or a bit of a cross bite happening on one side. And then we go to our second temporary, which is much more improved, because this is going to be a very critical step in making that prototype to final translation for your patient. This is the temporary setup. And then this is the patient's final. So this is, again, monolithic zirconia, upper and lower, and simply using neostaining. So you can see you can achieve very nice uh, aesthetic results using this staining combination product without having to worry about porcelain cutback. And here's the final. So you can see it, we've planned these implants perfectly guided ahead of time. If you were to do this freehand um, on cases like this with limited bone or in terms of cases that have uh, challenging anatomy, you'd be very hard to get everything lined up perfectly like we did here. So you can see the transformation here has been uh, very uh, radical for the patient. It's uh, a night and day difference. So let's jump into the video for this case. Again, to reinforce the points, beginning with our pin guide and pin holes.
and then full flap reflection and lingual tie back of the tissue on the palate. And then we're going to perform our bone reduction. In some cases, the guys do need to be removed, for example, when you're doing other procedures. So this patient in the back, one or two implants we did perform as well, indirect sinus lens. So I find it might, uh, at times you need to remove the guide uh, in order to have ease of access of other toolkits you may be using. Okay, ensure also to augment any areas that may be de uh, deficient. You can use a combination of either preservable membranes with allograft products or your favorite grafting techniques in these cases. Like I mentioned, check out our online forum, the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network forum on Facebook. It has a number of these cases that are there in depth, step by step, if you're want, wanting to learn more about them. In the future, uh, what are future possibilities? Uh, these are other techniques that I started to implement for full arch. This is what I call partial extraction therapy, and this is a technique in which we leave some elements of the teeth or roots in place in order to preserve the tissue architecture. That's a whole other separate topic on its own, but I wanted to give you a sneak preview of what's possible. So in, the, in this case, uh, recently completed again with the Neodent system, we were able to not perform any bone reduction at all on the patient. And we're able to leave the patient with something that is lifelike in crown and bridge form on full arch like this. So these results are also possible in select cases using this method. In conclusion, fully guided full arch solutions help to create a prosthetic driven treatment plan for your patients. Hands-on training is highly recommended from first principles. And this is not a replacement for understanding and going back to first principles but a way to help speed up the case if you understand how to uh, basically design the case and if you need to fall back on doing things freehand at the time of surgery. We've already touched base on this. So thank you for your time. This is my email. If you want to shoot me uh, any questions or case discussions you may have, just drop me a line at this email.